Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Opinions, Reviews, and Commentary. I'm your host, Lorenzo Marchese. I'd love to uh, talk about all kinds of different things and my views and opinions on them. And these are mine, only mine. Uh, today, we're going to talk about one of my, uh, my all-time classic favorite uh, television show ever, um, Star Trek. Now, I'm going to specifically focus on the original series, uh, but I'll talk a little bit about the, the various spin-offs and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, Star Trek, uh, I picked it up, actually started watching it in 19, I want to say 70, 71, when uh, it, it already was canceled, um, premiered in 1966. And uh, unfortunately, I was, I don't know how to say it, I was kind of like, I was on television and then it caught my eye and then I liked what I saw. I don't know if it was the, the story of the characters, but then um, it was my dad who encouraged me to you know, start watching the series. It's in syndication. Um, it quickly hooked on to me, loved the characters. I could relate to the stories in terms of how to deal the hu human dynamics. I was fascinated by the colors and the styles and the, of course the phasers and the transporters and the, the enterprise itself. I, that's when I first realized I got my bug for like being technical um, where I would take apart watches and be like the only one who could put it back together. Um, anyone can take things apart, but can you put it back together and make it work again? That's where I uh, got my enthusiasm for technology and science and all that other stuff. Star Trek just enlightened me to no end, you know, at that age, you know, in my uh, uh, before, uh, you know, high school and stuff. So it was a great show to watch. Now, um, I want to tell you a little bit about it. Probably a lot of this you'll know. Maybe hopefully there's little bits and pieces um, you won't or haven't heard before, which is uh, good for me because then I can, uh, you know, give you a little insight, things that you may or may not have known. Um, I'll talk about the characters, of course. First, um, first thing I want to share with you, of course, is the Star Trek uh, the title card, they call them. Um, let me zoom it up a little. Star Trek was, uh, yes, created by the Great Bird of the Galaxy was his nickname, or as he's become to be known as. Um, Gene Roddenberry. Gene Roddenberry came up with this um, this concept. He was a, He's a war veteran, a uh, military veteran. He went into the LAPD, Police Department Service, um, and was fascinated by writing and stories and things like that. And actually... Um, wrote for various shows, westerns and things like that, created his own series called The Lieutenant, which a couple of uh, regulars on Star Trek uh, made guest appearances on. Um, and from there, I came up with this concept, uh, wanted to sell it or pitch it to the networks uh, about a basically a wagon train to the stars because westerns were big back in the 60s. He thought, well, how am I going to hook the executives to spend the money on producing a show like this, you know, in the future uh, in space and told him it basically it's a Western in space. And that concept kind of uh, gave the green light to go ahead with the series. Um, and they made a pilot. Um, the pilot was um, called The Cage. And ironically enough, the networks came back with their review about uh, The Cage saying it was um, too cerebral it would make the audience think too hard, too much, and it might not gain the audience, which was ironic because the concept of what they were sold upon was, you know, wagon train in the space, you know, to, to educate you about the future, things to look for, to, to aspire to. Um, they thought it was just too much uh, for the head or the pu general public's head. Um, so in an unprecedented moment and something I don't think has ever been done before, they said, you know what, do another pilot, but show us the Western part, the wagon train part, the, the part that isn't so, you know, brainiac, so to speak. Um, and they created a, a second pilot called uh, where, no, where No One Has Gone Before, which is the pilot that the network saw. They loved and uh, bought the series. And from then on, it's history. Um, so uh, just so you uh, know, let me reduce this down, click the next button. There he is, the great bird of the galaxy, Gene Roddenberry, with, of course, a model of the original Enterprise on his desk. Um, this is the guy that came up with the concept, the 24th century, where disease and famine and everything's been conquered and, and, and there's no homelessness, there's no 
There's no racism. There's no none of that in the future. Um, you don't live for getting a job to make money to buy material things. You basically pursue whatever you want, your career, your interests, your talents, and you um, basically use them to better uh, society, be it medicine, be it art, be it theater, be it uh, space exploration, be it engineering, be it uh, uh, any kind of specialty uh, medical or technical kind of thing. It's, it's, it's okay to be whatever you want to be, an athlete. Um, and Gene Roddenberry said that you won't be discriminated against. And if there's any disease or health issues, we, we will have cured them by then. And technology will be used to benefit um, society as a whole. Um, he also created the concept of non-interference, um, which is the prime directive, which is as you explore space and, and whatnot, um, you can't change the evolution of another culture if they're not at the same kind of cultural level that you're being uh, introduced to them. Uh, you don't want to influence them because a, a bit of technology, say in the, say in the year 1300 and 1300s, say you brought your cell phone to the 1300s, that would look like magic. That would look like a miracle. That would look like, you know, it's not, it's really science and technology, but to somebody who's never seen something like that in terms of the prime directive, um, you could change their, their view of, of history, or their view of, of what they do or how they think. Um, and you don't want to influence natural evolution. Um, everybody will get to wherever they're going eventually. You just have to let them do it on their own. Sometimes you need a little push. You know, that's where the health issues come in and you cure cancer and cure all that other stuff, uh, as, well as, as well as societal issues, racism and, and bigotry and all that stuff. You know, get rid of that and growth is, is imminent in terms of knowledge and technology and, and well-being for mankind. Well, that was Gene Roddenberry's Utopia, and he kind of saw it through uh, with the Star Trek uh, legacy, specifically the, uh, the original series. And then he got to tool it up a little bit for the next generation when he rebooted the Star Trek franchise um, in 89, 88, 89. Um, so 1966, Star Trek premiered. It ran for three years to 1969 and created some wonderful stories, uh, wonderful episodes, thought thought-provoking um, entertainment, uh, humor, humanity, um, the contrast with the three main characters, uh, Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock, and Dr. McCoy. You know, you had the logic and the science and the technology of uh, Spock, and then you had the humanity and humility and, and reasoning of Dr. McCoy mixed with the, the, the wit and the um, experience and the uh, forthright of Captain Kirk all together making for a well-written television series. Now, there were a few clunkers, TV episodes, Spock's brain, let's not even get into that one. Um, but overall, 99% of the original series was amazing writing. Um, there's the cast. Uh, let me move my little image so you can see the cast. Um, that's everybody, uh, the regulars. Uh, in terms of the original series. I love the uniforms. Blue represented science and the red was the operational departments. Um, and then of course, uh, uh, the gold, which was the command and, and uh, security kind of uh, areas. Um, okay, so let's move forward to, well, we all know Mr. William Shatner, yes, the Shat. Uh, he played Captain James T. Kirk. To a lot of fans in Star Trek, Captain Kirk is the, the captain of choice. Um, of course, uh, Jean-Luc Picard, played by Sir Patrick Stewart, is an excellent captain. He's more of a, a diplomat, and uh, let's talk us out of the problem. Where Captain Kirk was the kind of nit and gritty, you know, you don't like what I say, bam, I'm going to punch you in the face, or you're going to attack my people. We're going to, you know, we're going to show you what the, the the problems are in being aggressive or bad or whatever. So he was very uh, action orientated, uh, love stunts. Um, kind of situation in terms of the acting part of it. Uh, but also, um, he, he brought a uh, sensitivity to the, the compassion. I mean, his acting was all about, yes, I, Chat you know, I can't do Shatner, but um, everyone else does. Uh, but he brought a unique style, you know, a signature to his performance that to this day, you know, like I said, people imitate him all the time. Um, Leonard Nimoy. Now, Leonard Nimoy, uh, he has since passed a um, wonderful actor, writer, director, producer, poet, photographer, 
uh, philanthropist, uh, you name it, he did it. Um, and an all around nice guy. I got to meet uh, all of the cast that you're about to see and never had a bad experience meeting any of them. Some are better than others in terms of their humanity and, and, and uh, down to earth personalities kind of situation. Leonard had the unique position of being in the original pilot of the cage. His uh, Vulcan, his Spock in that particular show or episode was a little more emotional and constantly yelled. Um, and that kind of, the yelling carried over into the second pilot uh, where no one has gone before, where they brought back the alien character. In fact, the network wanted to get rid of the devil-eared character because they thought audiences might not, you know, might be afraid of the show because of a devil on the, on the bridge, I guess. But Gene insisted um, on, uh, you know, having that uh, character because he represented aliens being, being the outcast. And there were a lot of stories about how Spock gets to fit in and feel different and all that other stuff, which for, for viewers and for kids who might feel that way, you know, it gives them a, a little outlet of, of, of hope in terms of, you know, you will not always be an outcast. There are a lot of people like you or have your same interests and it's okay to share that and be who you are. Um, and with that said, uh, Leonard Nimoy definitely promoted the whole uh, IDIC philosophy that Gene uh, invented, so to speak, the infinite diversity and infinite combinations. It is okay to be who you are, no matter what that is. Um, don't let anyone else tell you otherwise kind of, kind of thing. Um, and Leonard just ran with the role. He was smart. He was intelligent. He gave the, the, the logic and the lack of emotionless meaning to people who watch the character, even throughout the movies when he took it on. He, he knows how to deliver that humor without it being humor. So you're not laughing at Spock, you're laughing with Spock because Spock is clever and smart and all that stuff. So can't say enough about uh, missing Leonard uh, in terms of him being gone and what he did for Star Trek, including he invented the, um, the Vulcan salute, the live long and prosper. You can see in my little screen there. Um, it was actually a Jewish blessing he saw once. He, the script required him to say hello or goodbye to somebody. And he says, you know, Vulcans are a different culture this is what we do. And the director said, yeah, let's do it. And it's stuck with it ever since. Another little insight that um, Leonard created for his character was the Vulcan uh, neck pitch. Uh, in the scripts, after he did it, it was called the FSNP or something, the famous Spock nerve pinch or whatever. And that's when they would reference it, reference it in the script when Leonard would need to do it for the character of the story. But how that happened is one of the episodes, he's, there's a bad Kirk and a good Kirk, and he has, they have to go find the, the bad Kirk. And there's a point where the good Kirk and the bad Kirk are confronting each other. Spock comes up behind, and the script said, hits him with the butt of the phaser to knock him out so they can put the bad Kirk where he belongs, back in the good Kirk. But Spock said to the director, he goes, I, you know, we're sophisticated culture. Vulcans are logical. They've been this way forever. Let, let's let's say that the Vulcans have this certain energy uh, through their nerves or whatever that they can touch the um, through the neck or the back of the neck or of a person and render them unconscious, you know, thereby avoiding you know violence and the whole headbutting and bruising and all of this stuff. And the director says, "Okay, how would that work?" And of course, Leonard went to Bill, Bill Shatner, William Shatner, and said, "Hey, we've talked about it. Director's okay with it. Um, how do you feel? How you know how can we do this?" and kind of demonstrated what he would do, come up behind uh, William Shatner and, and touch his neck. Now, what, what made the, the famous Vulcan neck pitch so famous was not so much that Leonard came up with it, but Kirk or William Shatner sold it. The moment Leonard puts his hand on his shoulder, um, William Shatner just sells it. You, you can see the initial jolt, you can see him falling unconscious and he drops to the floor. And it's like, okay, Without that kind of talent, you know, the two men working together, Leonard and, uh, and Bill, um, it wouldn't have worked or sold to the director. And of course, the writers picked up on it and said, hey, this is cool, this is great, this makes sense because you know, again, Vulcans are you know, somewhat more evolved than humans. Well, we still have our emotions, they don't. They actually do, they just keep them buried. All right, let's move on to the old country doctor, Dr. Leonard McCoy. I uh, can't say enough about uh, missing uh, DeForest Kelly, um, an amazing actor, performer. You'll look him up or Google his uh, older movies. You can see him in Westerns. He was a bad guy 
most of the time in Western. So um, this is the first time he gets to play a good guy. And what Dr. McCoy does, he brings that balance of emotion with compassion. He kind of reminds everybody that you don't just do something because the rules say so, but sometimes you have to do or not do something because it's just the right thing to do uh, in order to make things you know, right. And his amazing chemistry with Leonard was just fun to watch on screen. They wrote it as such that obviously McCoy doesn't get all the logic and emotionless and Spock thinks he's just an emotional you know, balloon bursting every time you know, he bumps into a wall. Um, so that kind of dynamic was so fun to watch and energy. And of course, you know, um, Kirk Shatner was there to balance the two and keep the two apart and make sure that they were civilized in their discussions, if not uh, definitely energetic. So kudos to DeForest Kelly and the writers, um, especially uh, Dr. McCoy. He's loved by all who's ever watched uh, the original um, Star Trek series. Um, oh, got a tiny picture here. Let's blow him up. This guy, this guy is talented beyond belief. This is um, James Duhan, um, a wonderful actor, um, incredibly versatile. He is, was known, um, he's done a lot of TV before Star Trek, um, a couple of features, but he's noticed for, noted for his uh, voices, his accents. He does like 29 accents, uh, some incredible number, and he does them to a T. Uh, in this place, uh, uh, Scotty is an Irish, uh, um, excuse me, a Scottish engineer, and he gives that Scottish rogue and that, that, that total accent to it. Uh, if you talk to, J if you've ever talked to James Duhan, he's he's since passed, but when you talk to him, he talks normal. He's got this great uh, non-accented American voice. He's very down to earth, but he can switch on the British and the Afro Afro American and the Jamaican and the Scottish and the Irish and the all you know Australian. He can just Turn it on like a dime. Uh, very talented, very skilled, uh, very missed again. Um, he brought the, the sense of um, science to the, the series. He was always concerned about his engines. Uh, you know, and, and you know, Kirk would like, you know, run him to the rails and um, Scotty would remind him, you know, there's only so much we can do before they like blow up. Um, uh, giving her all she's got, Captain, that's what he was known for. But he was a smart character. He, he, he later in the feature films was uh, coined the phrase miracle worker uh, because he can fix, literally fix anything and everything. Now in Next Generation, he kind of gives a little insight to why and how he does the miracle worker thing, but I, I won't spoil that for you. You have to watch the, the episode. It's called Relics in the Next Generation. Okay, this is Nichelle Nichols, uh, a beautiful actress, Afro-American Afro uh, uh, performer. She's a singer. She's a dancer. And I've seen her perform in concert. She's just an incredible woman. Um, she's kind of um, uh, fading a little in her old age. Uh, and, and, and she's still beautiful, if you've ever seen her in person. She's not doing uh, conventions anymore, I believe. But, but um, Uhura brought a sense of uh, uniformity to the, uh, to, the, to the bridge, to the command crew. What was really cool is she was the, the in command. She was a lieutenant uh, eventually lieutenant commander and then commander by the movies, uh, but she was a woman in charge. She was uh, definitely the um, go-to person for communications and technology because she was always fixing things and, and whatever um, in terms of uh, the, the, the bridge crew and stuff. Uh, and she represented a, a lot of little girls back then. In fact, one of the stories is Whoopi Goldberg saw her on TV, ran to her mother and say, Look, mom, look, mom, there's, a, there's another woman who looks just like me and she's, she's not a maid. So um, the inspiration that Michelle gave to lots of women and little girls uh, throughout time is incredible. She was part of the, the program that in, recruited women into the actual NASA space program, um, which is just astounding because of her, her amazing intelligence and support of, uh, of uh, breaking you know, boundaries and things like that. Um, I can't go on how nice she was. Uhura was a smart character, a witty character. She's got some great scenes with Leonard Nimoy, and clearly she's an action adventure kind of woman. She's got some great scenes with uh, Shatner and them fighting aliens. Um, but all in all, just a well-rounded, um, nice uh, performance uh, about a character that's sympathetic and smart and, and knows what she's doing and, and better than a lot of guys doing the same job. Um, so. 
Uh, bravo to her, bravo to Jean for making sure Spock stays in the series as an alien and hiring Michelle to represent women as well as women of color. So incredibly done uh, in terms of casting. All right, this is George Takei. George Takei, um, currently he's very politically active. Um, he is now uh, out for uh, out of the closet back then. Um, he was a gay man, you know, had to keep things quiet, lose your job kind of situation. But now um, in the, uh, this current day and age, uh, the 2020s, he's, uh, he's a total advocate for diversity and you know, being who you are and what you want to be and not letting laws and governments change that and stuff. He's very much an advocate, political advocate for um, the right and justice and uh, again, diversity and so on and so forth. Now in the series, um, he was an amazing performer. He was the swashbuckler. He was the one that uh, took his shirt off and with a, with a saber and went around and uh, pretty much attacking everybody in the ship because of course he was drugged or whatever. And that's what the, the, uh, um, the story was uh, driven to go with, with a lot of the characters. But George gave a lot of uh, uh, sensibility and humanity to his, his character, Sulu. He related to everybody. He, was, he had a little bit of humor that, here and there. Um, and of course, he's uh, uh, Asian and Asian American. So now we have another uh, sign of diversity up on the bridge. Not only do we have a woman, a woman of color, we have an alien, but we have an Asian person on the bridge, which is, you know, is astounding. Obviously, uh, kids and young children like, oh wow, I can, I can drive a starship. I can fire phasers. I can beat the enemy. Um, gave a lot of uh, inspiration to a lot of people, um, even back then. Uh, as his character grew, uh, if you know George, he's a very strong and smart person. He, he always wanted uh, command of the ship, and by the feature films, he actually commanded the Excelsior. So he was Captain Sulu um, last time we saw him, and let me tell you, you know, he's, a, he's a great actor. He's got a lot of passion in all his performances, and um, just an all-around nice guy if you get to meet him. And if you do get the chance, make sure you say hello. I'm sure he'd appreciate it. Um, he's just a warm, uh, friendly human being. Um, and uh, kind of makes me teary-eyed when I think uh, how many times I've seen him and met him. Anyway, you go, George. Next up, we have ah, Mr. Walter Koenig. Um, now, the real story of this is his character was brought in the third season um, to capture the young, uh, mainly female, adults, the teeny boppers uh, at the time. If you notice, he's got this haircut. You remember Davy Jones of uh, the Monkees uh, and of course the Beatles back then. They wanted to attract that crowd. So uh, he created this character and uh, gave him the bowl haircut, that kind of thing, uh, or wig, I don't know what it was. But uh, and they introduced w uh, Walter's uh, character. Now, the, the public thing that was made uh, really prominent is that he's a Russian. Um, he's a Russian character. He speaks with a Russian accent, nuclear vessels, you know, from uh, Star Trek IV. Um, but because of that, we now had a, a multi-international kind of kind of uh, crew aboard the Enterprise. And because he was Russian during the the beginnings uh, of the starts of the of the Cold War with Russia, when we had uh, all the way through the, the 70s, um, it was prominent to see that yes, even once you know a, a culture that was considered to be the quote unquote enemy, uh, we're now working together in the 24th century. We don't have those bigotries. We don't, we don't worry about borderlines and how much uh, uh, profit or, or oil or whatever the thing is in terms of nations. We all work together for the common goal of, in this case, exploring space and learning more about science and knowledge and so on and so forth. And Walter was a great, great addition to the cast because uh, a lot of his scenes were with Sulu, uh, George Takei, and they have a great chemistry together. And uh, there's a couple episodes with, uh, we, you know, with him and uh, William Shatner that are really cool. Uh, a Western one where they kind of get forced into a Western environment, and he uh, he kind of falls in love with this uh, this bartender kind of girl. And anyway, you have to watch the episode. But Walter is uh, an amazing writer. He's so well versed in in the English language as well as probably others. But uh, he's a pro prolific writer. He was. He was one of the original cast members who wasn't asked back in the animated series, which came out in 74 by Filmation. Um, but he got a chance to write one of the best, if not the best, episodes uh, involving Spock. Um, uh, 
uh, in terms of the, the storytelling of the animated series. Um, not only that, he's got several books of his own and original stories he's created. Uh, just a smart guy, a really nice guy, well spoken. I just every time he speaks, I just I'm glued to his every word he said because he's so, you know, I can't say it enough. He's so intelligent. He's so so forthright. He's so knowledgeable. It's just, it just he shares all that with you um, if you get a chance to meet him. Um, him and his lovely wife Judy uh, are just just incredible people. Um, so. Hey, Judy. Anyway, uh, let's move on. Um, here we have uh, Mangel Barrett. Um, Mangel Barrett, now let me tell you her unique story. Again, back to the original pilot, The Cage. She was number one in the pilot, meaning next to the captain, she was the next person in charge of the starship, 300 people. Now, one of the network comments of, you know, we'll give you the new pilot, let's do the new pilot. But number one, you can't have the alien, because he looks too much like the devil. And number two, you can't have a woman in charge on the bridge. <gasps> oh my God, you can't do that. <clears throat> As a result of that, um, Gene had to make a decision. So he kept the alien and dropped the first in command uh, at being um, a woman. So in, this, in the second pilot, um, you don't see number one anymore. Uh, basically Spock fills that role as the next in command in terms of uh, the hierarchy of the starship. But Mangel comes back in the series. Uh, she's um, obviously a brunette in the pilot. So she said, you know, how can I present myself to Gene and the casting people so I can be on the show as a different character? So she comes in as a blonde, bleaches her hair. And sure enough, they cast her as Nurse Christine Chapel, Dr. McCoy's right-hand man. Um, and a, a pretty good, uh, you know, medical technician herself in terms of uh, the series and what they did as her character. But they also kind of give it a little twist where she has an affection for Spock. And there's a couple stories revolving around that knowledge of the infatuation or uh, devotion to um, their relationship. So uh, Mangel just knocks it out of the park when it comes to, um, to giving uh, a role of uh, empathy and passion. And she also has since passed away um, as, as uh, her husband. And here's the other part. Her husband is Gene Roddenberry. So technically her name is Mangel Barrett-Roddenberry, uh, but uh, she was married to the creator. They married after the series. So they met on the series, of course, and then uh, um, had a long lasting, uh, both um, uh, until they both passed away, they were married for that long. Uh, and so it was wonderful to see uh, how Jean kept her character and her performances alive. Now I say that because when uh, Jean rebooted Star Trek, um, the next generation when it premiered he brought her back uh, his wife at the time um, she got her natural hair color back uh, her dark brown hair color and she became Luaxana Troy which is Deanna Troy's uh, Marina Sirtis's uh, on-screen mother and let me tell you again she's a wonderful actress she's very tall very prominent very uh, bold but she made Luaxana so much fun to watch she was the arrogant and She's the queen of this and the commander of that. And the, you know, she's best thing since chopped liver kind of attitude and gave uh, Picard a lot to deal with when she came and, and visited uh, or her stories involved her. Um, again, wonderful performance. Uh, she'll be, she is sorely missed in terms of um, what she did. And another little bit of trivia. She was the voice of the computer from the original series all the way through the feature films, including the next generation, Deep Space Nine, uh, Voyager, and Enterprise. Um, Gene kept her on, and for some reason, that you know how some things have uh, 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 have a particular voice, and that's how you how you know them or whatever. Um, and that's how that that came to be. So when you're listening to the computer on the various series, uh, know that it's Angel Barrett uh, doing uh, doing her. Her computer. Um, now let's jump to 1978 for the release of the 1979 film uh, Star Trek the Motion Picture, sometimes referred to as Star Trek the Motionless Picture. Um, as you can see, they're all there in their pajamas. Uh, no, I'm kidding. That's their costumes. The criticism of the show of this feature film, the first one, was that it lacked color. And as you can see, it's kind of like a white and gray palette there. And as, um, 
and we'll talk about the next movie, but uh, this was brought about, this motion picture was brought about too fast, too soon um, because of Star Wars in 1977 being such success. Paramount said, we have a Star Wars, it's called Star Trek. Um, it's been around a lot longer and so on and so forth. So they kind of gathered it together. They got a great director, Robert Weiss, but not necessarily for this project. He's uh, Robert Weiss. Um, did all kinds of movies. He you know, like edited the, the Day the Earth Stood Still. He directed The Sound of Music and West Side Story and all kinds of fun stuff. But this this wasn't his genre. He admittedly did not know Star Trek when he went into it, but you know because of money and budget, prestige and promotion, they do that. Now, what's nice is um, they brought back everybody. Um, you can see all of the cast members, including this chap was there. But in the far back, you'll see Grace Lee Whitney. She played basically... I don't know, the captain's maid in the original series, um, bringing him coffee and whatnot. Not a lot to do responsibility wise, but kind of that generic 60s, you know, I guess the captain needs a, a maid kind of mentality. There's also um, Stephen Collins there. He played Will Decker, brought him as the captain of the Enterprise before Kirk took it, took it over. And then there's uh, the late uh, Persis Kambata. She was brought in um, to play this alien character uh, who believed in the, their race, believed in celibacy. Um, and then, of course, um, she ends up being the V'ger probe and moves the story forward in, in different ways. So, but that's the original cast. And as you can see, um, it lacked a lot of style and color. I love the film because of what critics uh, hated um, a lot was the 10-minute the fly around the Enterprise. Because remember, it's the first time, 1979, 10 years since we've seen the Enterprise or cast and crew. And of course they upgraded the Enterprise. It looks great. I mean, I love the original in the show, but the, the movie one was, you know, for the first time it's huge and big and, and Kirk flies around it. It's just, it was like candy for the eyes um, for people who love Star Trek at the time. All right, let's jump to, uh, this is the Wrath of Khan. Now, Wrath of Khan critically and fan wise has been probably ranked up there with one of the top two uh, favorite uh, feature films. Um, after 1979's Star Trek, uh, the motionless picture, came Star Trek to the Wrath of Khan. What was unique about this is it pitted Kirk basically against an old enemy. An original series episode called Space Seed involved the incredible actor Ricardo Montalban um, basically taking over the Enterprise, stealing the Enterprise, and um, um, trying to take control of it so he can dominate the universe or you know, be the bad guy that he is. Well, uh, Harv Bennett, who was brought back to revitalize Star Trek after the motionless picture, um, came up with this concept and looked at all the episodes and said, this is something we can do. Approached Ricardo Montalban and said, hey, would you like to do a show, you know, 20 years later, 15 years later, whatever it was, uh, reprising your character? And he was on board from the beginning. Um, it introduces Kirstie Alley, as this is her introduction as an actress on the big screen. Um, she became a little too big for her britches, uh, wanted more money, and so they recast for Star Trek III, unfortunately, because she did a great job. She was a great Savic, um, uh, half Vulcan, half Romulan, they made her. Uh, but as you can see, Leonard Nimoy, uh, Nichelle Nichols, George Takei, uh, DeForest Kelly, uh, Shatner, all came back. Look at the colors. The uniforms are amazing. They don't, they don't look like pajamas. They're layered, like wool layered. So, because in space it's cold. So, obviously, they're not, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, they call them space suits, but they're actually much in, more interesting looking um, uniforms. You can see the rank, which is on their shoulders, and the Starfleet emblem. Um, the color underneath, Spock's got a white. You can see uh, Sulu barely with the orange. Uh, McCoy with um, uh, his should be like a green, uh, Uhura's with this grayish, and Savik with the red all represent the departments they belong to, which I thought was a, a nice touch. Okay, next up, this is Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. Um, one of the things, and this is uh, spoilers here if you haven't seen Star Trek II, uh, one of the things, the uh, conditions that they got Leonard Nimoy to sign back up on was um, we'd love the opportunity to basically kill Spock. So by the end of Wrath of Khan, um, Mr. Spock is killed in saving the Enterprise in the process. What happened is Star Trek II became so popular, was so well, well received by critics and uh, fans alike, 
that uh, they immediately wanted to do a sequel. Well, Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock came about, um, and then um, they asked Leonard, Leonard, do you want to come back? Because we need you. This is this is a great franchise. It's doing well, and so on and so forth. What what do you want? What do you need to do? And of course, he put on the table um, that he'd like to direct. So this is the uh, directorial debut, feature length de directorial debut of uh, Leonard Nimoy uh, directing this movie. Now, ironically, go back to Paramount Pictures, I believe it was Michael Eisner, who was then president of distribution in, um, at Paramount, had said, well, I don't know that we want you to direct because you don't want, you don't like Star Trek. It's in your contract. And of course, Leonard said, if it's in my contract, show me. How can I not li like Star Trek, he said. And then uh, Michael Eisner's like, well, you wrote a book called I Am Not Spock. And he, and he started laughing. Well, it was an introspective perspective of Spock, actor Leonard Nimoy playing the character. Uh, and he goes, well, I also wrote a book called I Am Spock to counter that. So um, they couldn't find his clause in this contract. So he said, you know what? You want me back? Let me direct. So they let him direct, came up with a story about uh, let's bring Spock back to life, basically, with his Katra. And as you can see, they brought back Mark Leonard. He's in the far left there. He played Spock's father in the original series, came back for the feature films, which was amazing. Everybody's back. Uh, on the far right, you see uh, um, uh, Savick, uh, who was back, but was recast. You see on the, on the right there, uh, Savick, who was recast by Robin Curtis, who did uh, Star Trek three and four. Um, but it was a great, uh, great uh, story. Uh, it's very operatic much more or less low key than the Wrath of Khan, but um, had a wonderful reunion and uh, battle with the Klingons, uh, so on and so forth, um, to get uh, the Katra, which is in McCoy, back into the body of what is uh, Spock. Uh, in the center there, I didn't even mention, that's uh, Dame uh, Judith Anderson, Academy Award winning actress from long ago. Uh, they brought out a retirement. Um, Leonard asked if she would come and play the Vulcan priestess who basically puts the Katras together uh, in the right places. So it was a wonderful film. I really liked it um, in terms of uh, story-wise. Um, okay, this is probably, again, without a doubt, one of the top two favorite of the Star Trek feature films based on the original series with the characters. It's called Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. Okay, Star Trek III was, again, another success critically and fan-wise uh, in terms of seeing the cast. And then finally, um, uh, Paramount said, okay, Leonard, you knocked it out of the park. Can you do it again? And we'll do whatever story you want. It's all yours. Uh, him and Harv Bennett uh, will come up with the story. What's, what's ironic is, and I did not mention this before, is Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, which launched, relaunched the Star Trek franchise, was written and directed by, uh, co-written and directed by Nicholas Meyer. Um, Nicholas Meyer came up with... Uh, story concepts and character development uh, and Harp Bennett did uh, kind of the, the networking of the making the Starfleet universe uh, connect uh, as well as Nicholas Meyer directed uh, the, the first film. Uh, Nicholas Meyer was asked to come uh, asked to come back in terms of the writing and kind of developed the the story with Harp Bennett and Leonard Nimoy um, with uh, the fish out of water story. Basically, uh, they have to go back and save planet Earth because in the 24th century, it's under attack by an alien creature, or it's technically not under attack. It's kind of trying to communicate with its species, and its species happens to be a whale. So there are no whales in the 24th century because they went extinct because mankind killed them all. So they have to go back in time into what is the 80s, pick up a couple whales, bring them back, tell the alien to go, leave us alone, and end the story. Um, the reason I'm smiling is because the whole story unfolds and it's, it's, it's nonstop uh, humor and fish out of water and them adjusting to the language, them adjusting to the people, them adjusting to the environment uh, in terms of uh, Starfleet meets, you know, 20th century mankind. Uh, um, it's a great story. It's my favorite of the feature films, followed by the Rapicon, um, but it's definitely filled with humor. It's got a great story too, you know, trying to get the whales. They introduce um, a character, an oceanographer, who ends up kind of falling for Kirk. Wink, wink, what a surprise. Um, uh, but uh, I tell you, it's, it's a wonderful story, uh, wonderfully performed and excellently written. Okay, let's, uh, I was kind of thinking, should we skip uh, Star Trek V, The Final Frontier? 
or some like to call it uh, Star Trek V, The Search for William Shatner, uh, or The Search for God, or whatever. Uh, Shatner directed and co-wrote this um, piece. Now, he originally intends, and he, he's got a book about this, about how the movie was supposed to be completely different, but because of budget, because of Paramount being what, Paramount and whatever, um, he couldn't do what he wanted to do. I kind of think that the script wasn't well thought out, whatever, but um, a couple good performances in terms of the scenes and whatnot, but I don't know. I just couldn't handle the row, row, row your boat and all kinds of weird stuff that were in it. But this is behind the scenes, uh, Shatner directing uh, Walter Koenig on the bridge. Um, I believe this is when Cybok, uh, Spock's brother, yes, Spock's brother, out of nowhere, apparently, um, comes into the picture. So uh, I believe, yeah, there's another shot. This is where they meet God. I hate saying it, but it's true, or what they think is God. And uh, Cybok, uh, Spock's brother, kind of does this mind. Anyway, um, it's probably one of the features you could skip, um, but, you know, it is what it is. It's Shatner's thing, and, you know, he gave it what he got, and we got what he gave. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, let's move on. Now, this is a must-see film. This is Star Trek skit six, The Undiscovered Country. Um, it's always said that the even number films are the best, which is absolutely true. Nicholas Meyer came back and co-wrote uh, and, and directed this feature film. Remember, Nicholas Meyer is the one who directed and co-wrote uh, Wrath of Khan. He came in to juice up the script in Star Trek IV, and now they loved him so much that uh, executive producer Leonard Nimoy, Paramount gave him that title, said, you know, let's put this movie together. What do you want? So immediately knocked on Nicholas Meyer's door um, with Harv Bennett and said, you know, what can we do now? And at the time they were talking about the whole uh, China-American crisis. So they paralleled it with Klingons. So the Klingon, Klingons were China and of course the Federation was the United States. And uh, um, one of the funniest lines in there, and it may be timely because it People even today might not get it because this was this movie was made in the 90s. Uh, there's a line in there that uh, only Nixon could go to China, which got a great, huge laugh in the theater when I saw it. But I don't know if uh, young young people uh, would get it now, the, the reference. But anyway, it basically puts uh, Kirk against the Klingon um, high council uh, to the point where they accuse him of murder. They go to this planet. And it's a, it's a murder mystery because Spock and, and crew end up trying to figure out who and why they attacked the Klingon vessel. Um, Kim Cattrall, who's in the back there, right behind Spock, plays a, a Vulcan um, that is an amazing performance. Uh, Kim Cattrall, Cattrall, you know, from uh, Sex and the City, and one of my favorite films is Mannequin uh, with Andrew McCarthy. Uh, but anyway, um, great cast, wonderful story. It's a murder mystery drama uh, with a lot of action, a lot of adventure. Um, Christopher Plummer plays the, the head Klingon, the problem Klingon, who quotes Shakespeare throughout, which uh, Nicholas Meyer um, is known for that in terms of his writing. So it was a wonderful, wonderful, uh, wonderful job. So you have to see a film, see two, four, and six. Otherwise, give all of them a, ch uh, a chance, uh, check them out, and uh, you'll see the original series sprinkled throughout uh, pretty much all of them. Um, this was the promotional um, photo press thing they took. And when Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered uh, Country, premiered in Hollywood at the Chinese theater, um, they had a, I want to say, 40 foot by 80 foot uh, 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 mural of this, this photo, uh, right in the front. And they, there's a great picture of each actor standing in front of his own picture. Let's uh, do a little bit of nostalgia uh, after Star Trek had been canceled and picking up uh, popularity in syndication and reruns. Um, the, there was a big letter writing campaign about the space shuttle. The very first space shuttle, the test shuttle to roll out was christened the Enterprise. Um, and uh, millions of people petitioned this. So as a result, they invited the uh, cast and crew to come out and see the, the, the inaugural uh, launching, I guess, of the of the Enterprise. This is the one that sat on the back of the 747 and they released and they were testing the landing part of it and the flight controls in terms of the atmosphere. Um, this ship never went up in space. I believe right now it's at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Um, but it was the prototype to make sure it would work, you know, functionally 
in terms of being a um, space to earth vehicle, you know, landing safely. But uh, Star Trek was a part of it. Star Trek uh, culturally has been um, uh, heard and seen, you know, beam me up and warp speed and, you know, even the, the, the Federation's um, non-interference, all of that uh, has been uh, used in various forms. Um, there's another little uh, promotional shot of the three of them on the bridge, you know, staged obviously for um, a picture. Um, there's another, I love these kind of, I uh, wanted to give you a little insight. If you look at the technology, the buttons in the back and the little handles and whatnot, that's all reflective of the 60s. Um, they can only use what they had or were thinking would be used in the future back, uh, back then. Those are the dilithium crystals, by the way. Um, basically, they power the ship and a lot of other things. And Spock and uh, Scotty are going to fix it. Uh, again, a great little crew shot on the bridge, all of them uh, looking at each other. Uh, with insane power and passion. Um, something's going on, something important. Um, I did want to touch base on this. Um, you know, they rebooted the Star Trek franchise uh, in 2009. J.J. Abrams took it over, and I liked, uh, I liked the movies. I thought they were great in terms of adventure and, and action, and um, stories were okay, you know, pretty much, especially the first one. But the casting was far superior. You know, Chris Pine as Kirk, Zachary Quinto playing Spock, uh, Carl Urban, uh, Dr. McCoy, um, um, uh, John Cho playing Sulu, um, the late uh, uh, Anton Yelchin playing Chekhov, uh, Zoe Saldana as Uhura, um, and who am I forgetting? Simon Pegg plays uh, Scotty. Great casting. They did a wonderful job with uh, the performances and the characterizations. Um, and it was good to see, uh, good to see they took care of Star Trek the way uh, they should have. Um, just wanted to show you this. There's uh, the late, great Gene Roddenberry, the late, great um, uh, Robert Weiss, uh, the late, great DeForest Kelly, the late, great Leonard Nimoy. The only one alive in that picture still is uh, William Shatner. And this is uh, behind the scenes of Star Trek, the motion picture. You can see the pajamas are there. So. Um, what an incredible show. The original series, and I, I took you from the, the original series all the way through the feature films of the original series cast. So um, that was kind of cool. There were two pilots, of course. I mentioned that uh, for uh, six feature films. Um, and then the spin-offs, or the, uh, the continuations. In 1994, um, there was a movie called Generations, then First Contact, Insurrection, and Nemesis. Generations was a crossover Kirk and card kind of do their thing and the other three were uh, basically next, gener next generation cast. Um, the Kelvin timeline which is the story wise JJ created a whole new timeline so the new cast of Zoe Saldana and Chris Pine could go on um, Star Trek, Star Trek Into Darkness and Star Trek Beyond. Um, and then of course there's the broadcast television series which actually started on TV and then uh, continued. Of course, there's the original series, which ran from 1966 to 1969. Star Trek The Next Generation, which ran from 1987 to 1994. Star Trek Deep Space Nine, which ran from 1993 to 1999. Star Trek Voyager, first female captain, Catherine Janeway, 1995 to 2001. And Enterprise, formerly Star Trek Enterprise, or actually they put Star Trek in the last season, Enterprise, because people didn't realize it was Star Trek. Uh, that ran from 2001 to 2005. Um, I liked uh, like most of the series. Everything was was cool. Um, other spinoffs from the Star Trek franchise have included Discovery, which not one of my favorite shows. Picard, which I loved. Um, uh, Strange New World and Section 31 series have been in talks. I don't know if they're in production or if they're actually coming, but. They're, uh, they're on their way. And of course, the original animated series um, called Star Trek, the animated series, which ran from 1973 to 1974. Um, there's another animated series called uh, Lower Decks, which is currently running, um, not receiving great reviews. I've caught a couple episodes. I'm not too impressed with it. I don't know if they're trying to be a family guy or you know, intelligent series, but they're trying. Um, Again, the franchise has, has expanded into um, a theme park venue, one being the Star Trek Adventure, which was at Universal Studios, which I actually was a part of in terms of its setup. They did the special effects. I was one of the 
people that was the first beamed out, you know, playing on makeup and on the bridge crew. Um, that was a fun experience uh, to see. Uh, then there's also the Star Trek, ex the experience, which was um, a um, wonderful adventure in Star Trek Las Vegas, which was then the Hilton Hotel, uh, which was so popular, very, very popular. So popular, they opened up a second edition of the Borg uh, using Voyager as that cast um, on, a, on a real life adventure that you go into. They built sets, it was, you know, you go onto the bridge. It was really cool and I'm so sad that they had to take that away. There's also the Star Trek exhibition, which for almost, I think, seven or eight years, it was touring from city to city with props and costumes and things like that. Um, and then there's the uh, Star Trek, the Exploring New Worlds, which I believe is set up at Huntsville, Alabama, to educate kids on space exploration and, and uh, different technologies and space transportation, things like that. So Star Trek has had a legacy for um, you know, coming close to 60 years now. And it's just been amazing to, to see um, what, what uh, Star Trek has evolved into and has become. With that said, um, those are my um, actual opinions, reviews, and commentary about Star Trek, the original series. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope there were bits and pieces you learned from it. Um, let me know in, in, my, in the comments below if you had any questions or other um, things you didn't know about or wanted to know um, or wanted to throw out there for everybody else to know. That's cool, too. Um, but I do ask that you subscribe if you haven't already to the Geek Authority channel. Um, don't forget to click the little bell. That's the thing that lets you know when I drop new videos. It sends you an email and you can watch it at your convenience at any time. Um, also check out my other shows, The Geek Authority Show, where I interview actors, writers, directors, producers, and it's a fun place to learn stuff. And if you're into uh, getting into cosplay, even, um, the questions you might be asking or want to know, um, it's all there. And they're, everyone, all of my guests have been very generous and uh, I thank them all for being there. Um, I also have um, Unboxing the Geek Authority where I open up stuff that I get for the first time and you see it and I see it and it's so exciting. My, um, my reactions are genuine so I get sometimes get really excited about new stuff and whatnot. Uh, I also have the Geek Authority's Mysterious Chamber of Collectibles where I pull out some of my stuff in the closet under the bed um, where I've been collecting for years. Um, be, uh, and it doesn't, it's not necessarily sci-fi or whatever based could be books, could be all kinds of fun stuff. Um, and then I have a show called Talk About, where uh, some of my family and friends get together and we talk about different subjects. Uh, in particular, there's a three-part episode about Disneyland and California Adventure. It's emotional, it's touching. You should really catch that. Um, I loved doing that and had a great group of guests, so check that out too. So again, uh, thank you for watching this show. Thank you for uh, subscribing, because uh, uh, I hope you share it too. Let your friends know if their particular interests or have the same interests. That's always good to have new people, new uh, subscribers. So again, thank you for watching. And of course, we'll see you next time. So bye-bye.